Okay, excellent. So no conflicts of interest and no disclosures. I would like to walk you over the diagnosis and biology of CMML. How do we risk stratify and prognosticate this disease and then complete it with some treatment recommendations including future directions in this field. So CMML is a clonal hematopoietic stem cell disorder with overlapping features of myelodysplastic syndromes and myeloproliferative neoplasms. In 2016, the World Health Organization updated their recommendations for diagnosis. Importantly, the monocytosis is greater than 1,000 and should at least comprise more than 10% of the white blood count. And there are important molecular markers that have to be excluded before making a diagnosis of CMML. All of you are aware of excluding CML, but some of these rearrangements involving PDGFR, FGFR, and JAK2 need to be excluded largely by FISH technologies. And a clinical pearl here is that most of the times if these were to exist, you would see eosinophilia in the context of monocytosis. So that's when you really need to push the button and say, do we need to go down this molecular route? Of course, dysplasia may or may not be present. And an important addendum is in the absence of dysplasia, you can still diagnose CMML provided that there is a clonal cytogenetic or molecular abnormality. So this is the first time molecular genetics was incorporated into the diagnosis of CMML, and this included gene mutations involving ASXL1, TET2, SRSF2, and ZBP1. Now, I might say over here that none of these gene mutations are specific for the diagnosis of CMML. However, the TET2, SRSF2 signature usually skews hematopoiesis in the direction of monocytosis. These are some of the slides that we picked up from a classical patient with CMML. And as you can see, this is an abnormal monocyte referred to as a promonocyte. And the take home point here is that whenever your lab is reporting, blasts and promonocytes have to be summated and cumulatively reported as the blast percentage. I have seen laboratories split them out. And as a clinician, when you take this into context, for prognostication and subclassification, these are indeed considered as one entity. This is the bone marrow aspirate showing predominant monocytosis with granulocytic dysplasia. The core biopsies are typically hypercellular and an immunohistochemical stain called the dual estrase stain showing this blue and brown appearance is a hallmark of monocytic dysplasia and sometimes is important in distinguishing acute monoblastic leukemia from chronic malomonocytic leukemia. Subcategorization was also revised, and in the new classification, you have a new entity called CMML0, where there are less than 2% blasts in the blood and less than 5% in the bone marrow. And then CMML1 and 2 follows. Remember, anytime you see our rods, either in the blood or the bone marrow, it automatically pushes you up into CMML2, because these are markers of more aggressive disease or the likelihood of leukemic transformation. They also brought up an age-old question on why does this disease have manifestations overlapping between dysplasias and proliferative neoplasms? And is that clinically relevant? And this is where a lot of our research currently at the Mayo Clinic is focused. As you can see, this is our data set of 435 patients, and those with proliferative CMML had an inferior survival compared to those with dysplastic. And not only that, based on RNA sequencing and other work, there seems to be a unique biology segregating these, and there's more to come on this with time, but clearly a different clinical phenotype with biological uniqueness. Now, moving on to the genomics in CMML, this is something I often refer to as the Tower of Babel. Those of you who've read the book of Genesis, when civilization got so advanced, God said, now let's confuse them, let's confuse their language so they do not understand each other. And that's precisely what's happened with the advent of next generation sequencing. A CLL talk is full with alphabets that myeloid neoplasm experts don't understand and so on and so forth. But importantly, what I wanna highlight in this slide is that three genes, TET2, ASXL1, and SRSF2, comprise 80% of recurrent genetic events in CMML. 
So there are three genes that really make up bulk of this disease. It is the ones that involve epigenetics and splicing. And what is very interesting about this disease, if you consider the amount of mutations that CMML has per megabase of DNA, it's actually the least frequent. So here's malignant melanoma, lung cancer, where you have 1,000 mutations per megabase of the coding regions, whereas CL CMML and AML lie here with 10 to 15. And most of these are comprised of ASXL1, TED2, and SRSF2. In fact, nine genes make up 99% of the mutations that you see in CMML. But the only one that has clearly been shown to adversely impact survival is ASXL1. And what ASXL1 does is it's a truncating mutation. It impacts the polychrome repressor complex, and it leads to unbridled, activated transcription. And so a lot of genes which should normally be suppressed by this particular histone mark are now activated, and this gives rise to oncogenesis. Now, in malodysplastic syndrome, a session which you will encounter tomorrow, Fortunately, there's a very well-formulated prognostic scoring system. All of you are aware of the international prognostic scoring system and the revised version. But unfortunately, in chronic myelomyositic leukemia, as a group, we haven't been able to reach a consensus on what is the most effective way to stratify patients. And as a result, you can see the numerous models. These are all the clinical models that have been discussed and these are all the molecular models. So I'll briefly touch upon the strengths of these models and try and hopefully tell you where we stand in terms of disease prognostication using these. So we started working with this at the Mayo Clinic back in 2012 with a large database of CMML patients. We were able to identify anemia, monocytosis, thrombocytopenia, and circulating immature myeloid cells. This includes myelocytes, promyelocytes, metamyelocytes, and blasts as being adversely prognostic. In this study, we included all ASXL mutations, all different types, and found that they did not impact survival, and we came up with a clinical prognostic model called as the Mayo prognostic model. And as you can see over here, this stratifies patients into three groups, the low, intermediate, and high risk, very effectively validated in the Moffitt CMML database and outperforming some of the older models, including the MD Anderson model and the Spanish model. But at the same time, the group Francophone Melodysplasies, which is the French CMML group, they were working on their own database and they included only frame shift and nonsense ASXL mutations. They found that the missense mutations which we had included in our prior model, did not alter the ASXL1 protein. And as a result of it, excluded them and found this was one of the first papers to show that ASXL1 adversely and independently impacts overall survival. And this gave rise to the GFM model, which had three survival categories. And so we put a combined effort by using the French group as well as our original Mayho cohort and we decided to relook at ASXL1 after excluding the missense mutations and found that clearly the frame shift and nonsense mutations were prognostic. At this time, SETBP1 mutations had also been described, and in 420 patients, when you put it into the multivariate analysis, SETBP1 was not found to be significant. And so the two molecularly integrated comprehensive CMML models which were in a shared database of French as well as the Mayo Clinic patients effectively stratified. The curve on the left is the Mayo molecular model showing low, intermediate one, two, and high risk patients. And this is the GFM model, again, showing an effective risk stratification. Now, nine of the models, when compared side to side, were proven to be superior to each other. While unannounced, while this was going on, the Spanish group was also working on their model and they came up with the CPS molecular model, which was recently published in blood. A lot of the clinical parameters, as you see, overlap between all three models. So what's clearly bad is a proliferator phenotype. So if you have leukocytosis or monocytosis, okay, if you have anemia or red cell transfusion dependence as seen in the CPSS, this was the only model where bone marrow blast made a difference. But what they also did here was they created a genetic score. And this is a little complex, but they found mutations in ASXL, NRAS, 
run X1 and set BP1 to be significant. And based on cytogenetic stratification, where trisomy 8 is the most common cytogenetic abnormality seen in CMML, they were able to compute a genetic score, which then they incorporated with the clinical features and came up with a model that effectively stratified for both overall survival as well as leukemia-free survival. So where do we stand? Currently, there are multiple molecularly integrated prognostic models, namely the Mayo Molecular Model, the GFM Model, and the CPSS Model. Dr. Padron down at Moffitt had tried to do a side-by-side -side comparison using elaborate statistics, and currently the statement is that all of these are comparable with each other. Some of the newer molecular models have not been formally assessed. But the take-home message from this slide, which I hope to convey, is that regardless of the model that you use, the one mutation that very universally has been shown to be detrimental is ASXL1. And this is restricted to nonsense and frame shift mutations because they are the only ones that truncate the protein, unlike missense mutations that often do not. And we do have an MDS-MPN working group that is currently trying to address this discrepancy of having multiple models to come up with a unified approach on the lines of the revised IPSS. Moving on to therapeutics. The therapeutics for CMML is an orphan child, this section, because a lot of it has been bo borrowed from malodysplastic syndromes or maloproliferative neoplasms. And as you can see, the supportive care sections overlap, you know, with transfusional supportive care, hydroxyurea for proliferation, erythropoiesis stimulating agents for anemia, controversial role for iron chelation therapy. But there are directed therapies which are usually epigenetic, and these are either hypermethylating agents or clinical trials incorporating them. And the only potential cure remains allogenic stem cell transplant. The clinical pearls that are usually used for HMAs are that really there is no prospective trial that has assessed this in CMML. And so there were 11 patients on the ASA001 and seven patients on the French trial on the basis of which azacitidine got approved for treatment of CMML. Just you know, quite shocking to see how lacking the data was before the FDA and the EMA allowed these drugs for us to use. But the overall response rate is a disappointing 45 to 50 percent, and the true CR rates are less than 20 percent. And you know, if they do respond, it's about 12 to 18 months, but progression and survival is dismal after that. Most of the trials are summarized here for your information, and most of these response rates, the CRs, are between 10 to 17 percent, so very, very poor. But what is very interesting in an elaborate study that was performed by Professor Solari at the Institute Gustave Roussy in France, he looked and tried to understand how are hypomethylating agents effective in this disease. So the first slide, these next two are very important, showed that the mechanism of hypomethylating agents in this disease is largely epigenetic. So the ones who respond to HMA, and you can see the green lines, they have extensive demethylation because of inhibition of DNMT, whereas the non responders have no change at all in their methylome. But what was shocking when this paper got published is that, and I'm going to repeat this, there is absolutely no change in the mutational allele burden, even in responders. No change in the mutational allele burden, even in the responders. Look at slide C here. So these are untreated patients with CMML. These are patients who got azacitidine and did not respond. And these are patients who got azacitidine and were thought to be in a morphological CR. And if you look at the green lines here, these are time points at which they performed whole exome sequencing. And these are patients who we thought are responding. We have congratulated them. We have given them the good news. But look at this. With time, they continue to accumulate mutations. And in fact, this particular patient, UPN46, actually blasted off into acute myeloid leukemia while being in a morphological response. So the way these drugs restore hematopoiesis is by stabilizing or balancing hematopoiesis epigenetically. They have no direct cytotoxic effect on the leukemia stem cell. They're not affecting the mutational allele burden. And while you may be temporarily happy with the responses, you need to counsel your patients that they still are at an inherent risk 
for acute myeloid leukemia transformation or disease progression. What is also very encouraging is for the first time, the International Working Group proposed criteria for response assessment in the overlap syndromes. So all this time, CMML was lumped largely with MDS, and so we're using the IWG criteria, which as you know, is not applicable because these patients have splenomegaly, they have a lot of proliferative features. What I do want to state is that none of these criteria that I'm going to show you have been validated thus far. So please treat them more as a consensus recommendation. Now there are trials that we have launched which will try to validate these findings, but until they are done, I think they're a useful step forward, but there still needs validation on this. So apart from morphological CR, we've included complete cytogenetic remission, criteria for partial as well as marrow response, but most importantly is the section on clinical benefit which includes spleen responses that were never assessed in CMML because of MDS criteria, and symptom response. Dr. Ruben Mesa's group has come up with the MPN SAF score, and we have adapted that in the field of CMML to try and see if we can improve quality of life in this group of patients. In terms of allogeneic stem cell transplantation, there are a fair number of studies that have been done. This is potentially curative, but associated with a lot of morbidity and as physicians, it becomes imperative not to make the cure of disease more grievous than the endurance of the same. And so this is a balance that is very, very hard to strike. Most of these patients are elderly, they have comorbidities, they lack suitable donor options. And if you look at the latest report from the CIBMTR, which looked at 209 patients, half of them getting a myeloablative, half of them with a reduced intensity, you know, I draw you to this sobering disease-free survival statistic. At five years, it was only 20%, and the overall survival at five years was 30%, with 47% living with chronic graft-versus-host disease. You know, it's, it's often that this quality of life index does not get incorporated into our discussions when we talk about survival with patients. And this must change. And so the concept of graft-versus-host disease and relapse-free survival that the CIBMTR has proposed is now something we must factor in when we study this disease. So in, in summary for the treatment, about 30 to 40% respond to HMA. It's an epigenetic response, no change in allele burden, and allotransplant, although curative, is an option for very few of these patients. And my last slide is where do the future directions lie? And I think a lot of us are intrigued by the histone complexes, the nucleotide sequences, but thus far none of us have understood how epigenetic drugs should be administered. You know, on their own, all the epigenetic data has been quite disappointing in terms of durable remissions. You know, how do we time them with cytotoxic agents? And so a lot of this work is coming. In the interim, there are advances being made. SGI-110 is an analog of decidabine with a longer half-life. Uh, we have HDAC inhibitors that are undergoing trial. Epigenetic drugs like lysine demethylases, the Jumanji kinases, the bromodomain inhibitors. And then signal pathway, we have ongoing trials with the GMCSF antibody. And these cells are addicted to it in CMML and there's hope that this might reverse that and we're targeting agents like pololi kinases, aurora kinases, and we kinases. So the last slide that I have for you, it just summarizes this enigmatic disease. It is clearly an overlap syndrome. More than 90% have molecular abnormalities. TET2, ASXL1, and SRSF2 are the three most common. Only ASXL1 consistently has been shown to negatively impact survival. The GFM, the Mayo molecular model, and the CPSS are contemporary molecular prognostic models, and treatment options are currently limited with a lot of morbidity and mortality associated with stem cell transplant. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.